The world in 2050. I think many of us want to believe that the world in 2050 still could be like today's world, a world where sustainability is maybe even closer, uh, or at least not much further away than it is right now. But the trends suggest something very different. Uh, so let me list a few of those. Uh, right now, the projected population is 9.9 uh, .9 billion people for 2050. Uh, we have about 2.3 degrees Celsius of uh, average global temperature change baked into the future unless some m amazingly different uh, political futures happen. Uh, sea level rise is probably going to be uh, one meter. Uh, newest research has suggested two meters by 2100 is, um, is possible, and I think uh, that's still very optimistic. So one meter wouldn't be a surprising number for 2050. Arctic will probably be ice-free for at least 20 years by then. Uh, and many nations that are glacier dependent will uh, no longer have those glaciers. And, and with that loss will come a loss of fresh water and fresh water storage. Uh, 150 million uh, environmental refugees has been estimated for 2050, and that was quite a few years ago. So, I, again, I wouldn't be surprised if that number is much, much higher, especially considering increases in, in population growth as well. Uh, and a new study in Nature actually found that uh, average flooding damages will be about a trillion dollars each year uh, from, from uh, climate change and, and other uh, disasters. And of course, uh, you know, the, this is an unguessable one, but uh, most likely environmental conflicts will, will increase. Uh, those conflicts rooted in, in environmental change from famine, droughts, disasters. Uh, and, and also, as all these massive changes happen, most likely uh, government uh, and, and gross world product and, and GDPs around the world uh, will shrink. Uh, there will probably be some uh, profits to be made, uh, especially those who uh, are in the disaster cleanup business or in the privatizing of ecosystem services, those who can create uh, new private forms of, of or commercialized forms of pollination and freshwater provision. But overall, there will be a contracting economy. And, and with that will come uh, a significant contractions in, in government expenditures. Uh, what does that mean? Well, uh, less uh, public health care, less education expenditures, less maintenance of, of critical infrastructure like roads and bridges and, and pipes to supply water and natural gas. And so apart from the lives of the much smaller consumer elite uh, in 2050, uh, they're not the 2 billion consumers today, but I'm probably a much smaller percentage uh, who is able to, with their dollars or uh, yen or uh, euros, if there's still a euro, uh, they'll be able to uh, continue up this uh, consumer lifestyle. But the vast majority of, a majority of us will not. Uh, and that and that's the path we're on. I mean, I, I'm I'm getting more and more frustrated. I admit with the diluted view of the future that we can kind of get to a positive 2050. I think we could have gotten to a positive 2050 if we listened to the Dana Meadows, the Paul Ehrlichs, uh, and the other uh, prophets of the 1960s and 70s who warned that we must make massive changes uh, today. Uh, but 40 years have been lost uh, between now and then, and uh, everything is getting much further away. Uh, a sustainable future is getting much further away than um, it ever has been before. Uh, I mean, you can see the, the hope is that we get to a stable two-degree uh, future um, by 2050. And But again, I mean, with the growth in population, the growth in consumer class, the half a trillion dollars a year spent every year on marketing the consumer lifestyle, and the confessions slash celebrations by the fossil fuel industry that we're just going to keep on, on uh, pumping oil and, and, and drilling, uh, because that's what the demand, uh, that's what is demanded of us uh, because of the growth in, in energy demand. So the idea that we can get to a, a sustainable 2050 
is is harder and harder to to fathom. And and if you still aren't convinced, let me put this data in front of you. Uh, this is a figure from the State of the World 2013 produced by my uh, two of the authors, uh, Bill Reese and Jenny Moore. Uh, Bill Reese, who, as many of you know, uh, helped co-design the, the ecological footprint method. And this is trying to look at what a one-planet lifestyle would look like. And, and keep in mind, this was produced in 2013, so this is assuming a 7.1 billion uh, population. Uh, right now we're at 7.4, and by, uh, by 2050, that's, again, projected to be 9.9 .9 billion. And so if you can see three-planet lifestyle, which is the European lifestyle, that's not even the American lifestyle, which is four planets, uh, is, is uh, significantly higher than what a one-planet or fair Earth share uh, lifestyle would look like. Uh, you know, a, a third reduction in, in calorie consumption, significant reductions in living space, in, in electricity and energy usage, in car usage, uh, and, and ownership from a half a car per person to 0 0.004 cars per person, uh, you know, much, much less flying uh, and uh, driving and uh, CO2 emissions. Uh, that is really, really hard to, to wrap our heads around. I mean, I, I tried to put that in a more simple way, minimal flying, multi-generational and smaller homes, smaller families as people choose to have one or no children more and more um, to offset and to stabilize our, and, and to, to grow our population. Few or no private cars. And, and the number 0.004 is hard to, wrap, hard to wrap one's head around, but in a city like where I live in Washington, D.C., uh, where we have about 600,000 people, uh, that's a total car fleet of about 2,500 cars. So that essentially translates to no private cars. Once you add taxis and, and police cars and uh, ambulances and buses and trucks, and, and you're talking about very few cars, maybe one for the president, but certainly not one for senators or the mayor or, or the average Joe who lives in the city. Um, and so that those numbers are so hard to, to imagine from where we are today that the idea of a, of a smooth transition to a sustainable future is, is harder and harder to, to grapple with. And, and that's not to say that uh, we shouldn't be advocating for that. I mean, I, I, for the last 14 years at Worldwatch, I've you know, been strongly focused on studying consumerism and global trends. And since 2010, I have been an advocate of, of transforming cultures, literally trying to shift cultural norms so that living like a consumer is taboo and living a sustainable lifestyle has become normalized uh, and, and totally acceptable and, and even celebrated. Uh, and I've tried to do that in, in through writing. Uh, I worked with a, a game company, uh, the Catan, to, uh, to co-opt, in a sense, or, or utilize their amazing game that's uh, played around the world in, and make it into an environmental education tool that helps to walk through the process of leaving oil in the ground and the, the difficult debates around uh, climate change and, and using less energy and not growing. Um, and most recently tried to create a reality television show uh, that took millennial Americans and encouraged them uh, and, and supported them to move back in with their parents to convert the for help convert the 40 million acres of lawns in the United States into small scale sufficiency farms and in the process uh, help to rebuild multi generational households uh, getting more people back into those space help to uh, get millennials out of the, the consumer economy. Uh, making them into to sufficiency farmers who generate very little income, but instead generate a local, healthy, sustainable food source for their communities and families. Uh, of course, that uh, is a hard sell uh, to get a, a network to um, to go with some things. So, uh, I guess. Trojan horse-like for the end of consumerism, but uh, we got further than I expected with uh, six millennials uh, signing up to join and and uh, and making a plan on how they would be yard farmers, and and we still are 
trying to, uh, to, to move the, the topic forward, but the broader concept that drove this work was to recognize that we need to start transforming what n a normal future pathway is. But in truth, uh, it's, it's not going to be so easy to transform a giant and powerful consumer culture that has become globalized now and make it into a sustainability culture. Uh, so we also, I think, have to start thinking of an alternative indicator of success, I think, uh, for the environmental movement. What is our goal? What is what can be considered success, considering that we cannot stop a collapse of, of modern consumer civilization and the suffering that that's going to bring? Uh, is, is that mean we've lost? Or does that mean we have to think through an alternative success strategy? Uh, and, and this is what I've been thinking about for, for several years. Uh, you know, th this question of Maybe the end is not collapse, but maybe there is something beyond that that we need to be thinking through. Uh, you know, civilization has collapsed many times and it's rebuilt post that. Uh, so let's stop thinking about the, the short term and trying to stop something that probably is no longer preventable um, and, and instead start thinking through the next stage. Um, and, and I want to maybe tell a r recap a short story uh, that is really essential in this conversation, which is, is the science fiction novel, A Canical for Leibowitz. Uh, this, if you're not familiar with, is about a post-apocalyptic, post-nuclear apocalyptic uh, world where uh, books have been burnt uh, out of anger for, for the nuclear apocalypse. And a small group of, of monks um, take it upon themselves to guard the knowledge of, of, you know, of modernity uh, until the time where people are once again ready to, to discover it. Uh, and over the course of the story, uh, civilization redevelops and, and it becomes ready to take upon itself that knowledge again, uh, discover, rediscovering electricity and lights uh, and flight and eventually nuclear power again, and unfortunately again, nuclear warheads and nuclear war. Uh, and the end of the story is that the whole world is destroyed, this time for good. Uh, and that is, is a realistic scenario, not the nukes and, and all the kind of the stories of the, of the science fiction, but the grow, collapse, grow, collapse uh, scenario is, is we see that in ecosystems all the time uh, and we could easily do that ourselves. Uh, after the collapse, we could once again hold on to power and redevelop and, and sustain those small consumer bodies and as the majority of people um, disappear and then you know grow again and, and build again in this consumer unsustainable pathway. But the alternative, the ideal that I think we should all be striving for is to create an ecocentric culture, the, build the seeds for that now so that during the collapse that can develop and grow and become the alternative, become the path that we go down um, the next time civilization develops. Uh, if we can, in a thousand years, end up with a, an ecocentric civilization that is deeply in balance with the earth, uh, is sustaining our human population at a level that is not a burden, uh, in designing buildings and, uh, and you know, cultural artworks and, and food and and clothing that is not degrading the planet, but is sustaining the planet and sustaining ourselves, that is what we should be aspiring for. Uh, but I don't think we can get there with the current conversation. Uh, and in fact, I have ar started arguing for a, a consideration of an eco-missionary philosophical movement. And, and why do I use those terms? I mean, missionary is a is a negatively connoted word now, um, you know, because of because of two thousand years of, of missionary work, perhaps. But 
but in truth, it's been some of the most powerful ways of communicating and spreading cultural ideas and ideologies that exist. Uh, Christianity, Islam, and Buddhism have spread across tremendously different geographies, across different cultural realities, across even temporal realities, uh, to be able to spread over 2,000 years uh, or more or you know, less in the case of Islam, uh, there, that is something that's truly amazing that our short-lived environmental movement cannot replicate right now. We have right now are mostly a special interest that advocates for you know, short-term changes, uh, either you know, saving some land or dealing with, the, with the, the symptom of CO2 emissions rather than the deep-rooted uh, cultural problems that are more at the heart of climate change and other ecological problems. So what if we reinvent the environmental movement as an eco-missionary philosophical movement? What, what would that look like? Uh, and so let me start by kind of glancing at what a religious philosophy entails. I mean, I listed it here just very briefly, ethics, cosmology, mythology, communitas, so that community that is, is bonded uh, of, of, you know, of adherence, rituals, uh, and, and theodicy, which I think is a very important one that we don't even grapple with. And theodicy is, is a theory of suffering. Why is there suffering on earth? Uh, and and if, until we develop these, until we really deeply develop an ethics uh, uh, around the earth, uh, that, you know, that which hurts the earth is, to poorly quote Aldo Leopold, is, is not right, is, is ethically wrong, and, and that which sustains the earth uh, is, is, is right. Uh, you know, rerouting our, our ethical codes around earth, earth-centric models, um, cre building a deeper cosmology, building a communitas, and, and, and rediscovering the power of rituals that we don't really grapple with in the environmental movement, um, and which are unfortunately mostly commodified and, and consumerized, whether we're talking about $30,000 consumer orgy weddings that are the norm now, or the deeply polluting uh, $10,000 funerals that you know, embalm bodies with toxic chemicals and surround them with non-biodegradable caskets and plastic vaults and then buries them in a, in a cemetery that is then pesticide sprayed and monocropped with green grass. I mean, it's a deeply horrific way to end life today. And if the environmental mind or community could would come around to that and start rediscovering the green burial, which, which it's starting to, but to really build that into a deeper way of, of relating to the earth, there could be a real power there. Uh, and I think most importantly, um, the piece of religious philosophy that I want to focus on, uh, of missionary religious philosophies, is, is that of service provision. Uh, they're not just spreading a, a nice set of ideas without first, without also um, providing services uh, to those people who become, in, and sometimes become future adherents, but even when not, um, are shaped and influenced by by the philosophies. Um, I mean, I put up these quick images of, of Catholic schools because they pretty much capture what we should be doing, uh, you know, educating mind, heart, and spirit. Uh, we, we transform the world. Um, one who's partial to the, the verb transform. Um, but this is not the transformation that I am imagining. Um, but yet there are Catholic schools and, and, and Christian schools all over the world. Uh, in, in the slum of Kibera uh, in, in Kenya, I mean, almost the majority of of schools there are religious schools uh, because the government can't provide that service uh, whether through not having enough means or, or corruption wh whatever the reason um, they don't provide that service and and religious schools filled in the gap and the num you know into the hundreds of schools uh, and the number of ecological schools or environmental schools is zero um, and yet we have something to teach that's even more relevant uh, than, than the Catholic schools of yesterday. Uh, this is from an upcoming State of the World report, uh, the 2017 report that I'm managing now, 
on Earth Ed, Earth Education, Rethinking Education on a Changing Planet. Uh, if, if we're really serious about how we're going to teach children um, in a way that prepares them for uh, life on a changing planet, it has to include a lot more than what we're teaching them now. We don't need our children to be learning how to play with iPads at four and five. Uh, we need them to have basic skills, basic cooking skills, basic farming skills. We need them to have strong socio-emotional learning skills so that when conflicts break out in the future, which they inevitably will, um, they'll be ready for those. We need, we need moral leaders. We need to teach moral leadership and, and critical thinking and systems thinking uh, and deep learning so that they know how to learn how to learn even as the, the realities around them are changing. Uh, and, and those are skills that will be highly valuable right now. I mean, there is a, a renaissance around uh, socio-emotional learning right now uh, in schools, and, and there's uh, more and more attention on moral education and, and life skills and, um, and nature connection. Uh, so there will be a demand for, for a robust type of Earth-centric education if we develop that. Uh, and most importantly there will be a deep and lasting value for those who go through this educational model. Just like with a Catholic school, I would imagine 99% of students who graduate do not become Catholics if they weren't already, uh, but they have some of those values and some of those skills um, deeply rooted into their, into their beings um, graduating. And, and I would say the same thing with, a, with an Earth-centric school, an Earth-ed school, where uh, most people probably won't graduate as uh, ecologians, uh, but they would um, be you know, aware of how to grow their own food, how to cook their own food. That would improve their well-being in the short term. Uh, so many children are now overweight or obese. But if you actually uh, you know, start teaching them the skills to, to eat healthy, to cook their own food, that will change. They'll also probably learn primitive and, and primitive skills, which are also incredibly important um, as a, both a way to connect people to the planet right now, but also in, in surviving uh, in the future. Uh, my son, who's four, uh, and I have, uh, it's the fall, and we've been processing acorns uh, for the first time successfully together. I've done it a few times on my own, but he was a, a real help, and he has been um, uh, you know, really uh, fully involved in the process of converting acorns into a non-edible uh, food uh, because of all the tannins and, and um, chemicals that prevent us from just eating acorns, leaching them uh, and making them into flour and, and cooking with them. Uh, he's also even been helpful in, in grabbing the acorn weevils in the bad acorns and, and saving them for later for when we uh, start cooking with bugs, which again, Horrific for the majority of people today, um, but the majority of people uh, you know, will need to eat bugs in the future, and, and many cultures already do, and they're a step ahead. Uh, but we need to start understanding the value of, of, of the foods that are going to be sustainable and available, uh, and, how to and how to process them, how to cook with them. Uh, now, so that even if we choose not to do that, while we can still go to the grocery store, when the grocery stores empty out um, in those times of crises, uh, we will have an alternative. Uh, and those individuals uh, the, who actually have gone through that will there be there in their community and ready to teach others uh, as well, uh, so that civilization can, can, can rebuild in a right direction, in a sustainable direction. Um, and just as forest schools uh, could be a, a major domain for, for earth education, I think we can be even more creative. This is a, a Nigerian school, a floating school, where uh, you know flooding was happening so often that they built this school on a boat. Uh, you know, not a, a very portable boat, but a boat with three classrooms that could be uh, that could survive even even flooding. Um, you know, by getting creative, by applying the environmentalist mind to to opportunities that we're not looking at, because all we're doing is, is focusing on, on defense, on, on s slowing CO2 emissions. Uh, we, by really shifting our focus and, and thinking long-term, thinking over the multi-century frame, 
uh, we really would have an opportunity to, to redirect civilization in a, in a much better path. And it's not just schools. There are so many different uh, social services that we could provide, so many social enterprises. A lot of these that I'll describe are revenue neutral or even revenue generating. Uh, schools I mean, can, can pay for themselves through tuition, through, through state support. Um, midwifery programs uh, are all, another great example. Midwifery is being lost in so many, in so many places in the United States. Uh, Ina May Gaskin has really helped to resurrect this lost art, um, and more and more um, hospitals are starting to provide uh, midwifery programs now, and that's essential considering that a third of American women uh, get a C-section, which a cesarean section, which is uh, bad for the baby, bad for the woman. Uh, and, and bad for the earth. I mean, that's a much more ecologically damaging pathway uh, to deliver a baby than, to the, than the natural way, uh, than the way that Mother Nature uh, intended. Uh, and of course, cesarean sections are, are important when they're necessary, but um, research suggests that's about 3 to 5 percent, not 33 percent. Um, so redeveloping the midwifery programs, um, you know, and using that, which is a ritual, you know, a rite of passage, the, the giving birth, weddings, uh, deaths, those are, are moments in life that are very, people are very open to, to change, They're very open because so much is changing. Uh, and to have a midwif midwife who is a wise woman who is teaching uh, about uh, right diet for child, right diet for mother, uh, are the midwife that my mother, uh, that my wife uh, at, uh, went with, and that I joined her for every um, every meeting, uh, you know, was a heavy, heavy advocate of no white flour during pregnancy uh, because it's that exacerbates you know large babies and exacerbates cesarean sections, and and by providing that traditional knowledge that is no longer deeply provided at, at the OBGYN, the, the, the hospital setting. Um, that helps to redirect, uh, you know, again, you know, individuals and, and eventually entire communities uh, as people move away from the white flower uh, for the pregnancy and feel better and start changing the diet for their child. They also change the diet for themselves and get healthier, lose weight, um, use fewer resources, and get down to that 3,000 uh, to 2,000 calories um, that is part of that one planet living. And finally, uh, just to talk about one other rite of passage is, is, is death. And, and I've already hinted at how unsustainable death is today, but it can be truly restorative and truly transformative. Uh, you know, the, the death process is, is so painful um, for anyone who's lost a, a family member um, you know, and, and especially made worse when, you know, the, the modern, um, at least American way of death, uh, and, you know, has, which has been criticized for you know, 40 years now, uh, it's so soulless, it's so ecologically and financially taxing, uh, instead of you know, bringing a shrouded body uh, taken care of by the loved ones themselves and, and burying it in a natural setting, planting a tree, watching that tree develop, um, in part pulling the nutrients from that loved one's uh, remains uh, and growing over, over decades. That's a hugely different and positive experience that um, is, is nothing like a, a death today. Um, and, and these are just kind of, I mean, I bring these up as, as ways to kind of look at immediate pathways to get to that deeper ecological philosophy. Uh, but, but in reality, there's, there's so much more. I mean, this is, this is, the, this is the beginning of, of an ecological uh, missionary movement, if, if one uh, or if many uh, develop over, over the decades of, of, of rapid change that are coming. But there's so much that could be taught at the community level through, through fellowship, through uh, spreading a new set of ethics through these social services and over over the centuries could lead to a, a, a whole ecocentric uh, way of being. Um, and and it's, it's nice to say that, I know, and it, maybe it sounds too utopian to imagine that, but I think let me end with an example of, of one cult that grew very large, uh, you know, to more than a billion, um, even though it started with just a handful of people, and that's Christianity. 
Uh, and, and when a sociologist, Rodney Stark, looked at how it went from a few dozens to a few hundreds to a few thousands to tens of thousands to, to millions um, in, a pure, in a beautifully exponential curve, uh, he theorized and hypothesized that uh, it was partly their, their, their values and their culture, but it was also their service. Uh, during the ancient uh, epidemics that, uh, that the ancient world suffered, uh, while pagans typically fled from the cities during epidemics, uh, all, all for themselves, um, you know, the Christians stayed behind and, and helped, not just their in-group, but you know, the, helped their neighbors, and they, they took care of, of other pagans who, who were suffering and, and, and ill. Um, and that had lasting repercussions, right? Each pagan saved, uh, not only were they you know, more likely to convert, because of the just the, the awe and the the uh, indebtedness to the Christians, uh, but as Rodney Stark points out, many of these pagans' uh, social network links were dead um, because they died in epidemics um, because they weren't helped by Christians who who were you know taking care they they, they fled, um, so their social networks were depleted and the Christians who gave them so much and so, who literally saved their lives um, were were there and and so more and more people became Christians and I can see a, a very similar scenario I mean with nine point nine billion people. Um, you know, if we get that high, realistically, epidemics of, of the future, of the near future, will probably slow down that total growth uh, and, and eventually contract, pull those numbers down. There's going to be a lot of suffering. There's going to be a lot of famine and, and epidemics. And, and ecologians who, who take care of and help to provide those basic health services, uh, provide midwifery services, who take care of the dead, uh, who teach children how to survive on acorns and, and you know, wild foods and farm uh, small lots to sustain their families. Those services and those individuals and those communities will start to grow and start to, if all goes well, move our civilization down a path that is deeply respectful and restorative of, of the planet and starts to bring us down a, a path that doesn't look like part two of Canical of Leibowitz, but really becomes a deeply ecocentric and sustainable place to be, even if we have the memories of a dark age in between our ambitions for a sustainable future and our eventual arrival to that sustainable future. Thank you very much, and I can't wait for our comments and discussions over these next few weeks.